Praise the Lord. Well, I want to thank you so much for being here today, and, and, and we're going to, we, we, we've got a lot of things that we're going to try to cover today, but today's really just an intro to a brand new sermon series. And as I was thinking about today's sermon series, I wanted to just mention a couple of things to you, just to kind of give you an update. Let me tell you guys, I want to thank you for your Red Sack donations. And for those of you that don't know what that is, that's where we brought our groceries. We collected over 233 pounds of food. And that was, and it was delivered, and, and every time they were unloading with Dana, Dana was there, and they were just like putting it in baskets, and they said, oh my goodness, this is exactly what we need. Oh my goodness, that's it. We, we, we just ran out of that yesterday. And you know what Dana said to him? She said, I, I called ahead of time and asked what we needed. And she said that day they were planning to go shopping because they didn't have the summertime needs. So I want to thank you, Lighthouse Church, for meeting some of those summertime needs for folks in our community. And uh, immediately following church, if you are, if you're part of the VBS leadership team, you're part of volunteering and being a part of all of the, you're, you're a ministry partner with Melody and everything that's going to be happening with VBS, immediately following service, we are going to have a meeting for that. And let me just make one last final push for our Oasis. It, it, we, we need to have 10 people sign up. I think we're seven or eight. We got 10, so we're going. But we can add more, as long as we had to have a minimum of 10 to go. So thank you so much for going. Let me, let me ask you a question as we get started. Have you ever asked yourself the question, what should I do? H have you ever been in that moment of life where you say to yourself, what am I going to do? What should I do? And, and that question is so, so, so real. We, we, we ask ourselves that question in various forms and in various ways Every single day. Every one of us do. Multiple times a day. We all have decisions that we have to make. We all, have, uh, we, all, we all are looking for direction in certain areas of our life. And often those decisions require some sort of assistance. Help. We need some help. Sometimes it's a spouse to a spouse. Sometimes it's a, 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 an employee to an employer. Sometimes it's a, a friend to a friend. Sometimes it's a parent to a child. We all need help from time to time. According to the, the Harvard Business Review, I was just kind of doing some study this week as we get started on a brand new sermon series called Lead. And I was just, the, the amount of decisions that we make every single day. They say that 33 to 35 thousand decisions are made every single day. And in those decisions, they can be simple decisions from like, what am I going to wear today? All the way to catastrophic decisions about where I'm going to work today or if I'm moving or if I'm having to open a new bank account. Things that are bigger and better. Our decisions are often influenced and led by several things. And I just wrote a few things down here. Did you know that our life experiences often guide the decisions by how we're led? I've done that before, and so I'll do it again. Some of us have had decisions, you know, lately we've had, some, we've had some recognition of social influences. One of the biggest things right now that's leading and guiding and influencing our community right now about right decisions and wrong decisions is social media. And can I just say this real quickly to you all? Sometimes social media isn't right. We can have spousal opinions. Our spouse has an opinion about it, and so that leads a decision of financial security. Sometimes we make decisions based on a financial decision, and sometimes we make decisions based on parental ideals. This is the way we were raised, and so therefore I make that decision. And sometimes we're led by our education and our training. One thing I was laughing about as you were talking, Pastor Candy, and, and isn't it good to have Pastor Candy and Pastor Barry back? They were on vacation for a couple of days, and so good to have them back in the house. But you were telling the story of John Hagee, and, and Pastor Hagen was telling me one time, most people don't know this, but Pastor Hagee and Pastor Hagen went to school together. And he said, we were troublemakers. And he said, I'm not telling you nothing besides that. That's all I can tell you. So, so these two great men of God, Pastor Hagee and Pastor Hagen, built these global ministries, and they got themselves into trouble from time to time. They were, they were, they were hallmates. They, they lived on the same hall. We can make decisions by our church upbringing. How many of you make decisions by a church upbringing? You know, you look at, you make it, uh, you know, that's the way my church did it, so therefore I do it that way. Did you know that we make decisions also from political beliefs? 
We make decisions political. But, and, and, and there's so many things that are happening right now because in today's life, life is hectic. Life can be crazy. And all of us have to, we, we're filled with impressions and images and influences that guide and direct. And the noise that we're fighting for on a regular basis that is trying to get our focus off God. And as we get ready to, 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 to lean, lean into a brand new sermon series, I was thinking about when it comes to decisions and how we're led. And sometimes we get to this place where we no longer want to be led, but we want to do it ourselves. I was thinking about my girls when they were little. They came to a certain age, and if any of you are parents, you would recognize or you've done child care or anything of that nature. Uh, You've worked with children in a children's ministry. You've taught in a school or what have you. And, and, And kids get to a certain age, and they say something like this. They can't even form the sentence perfectly, but it sounds like this. I do it myself. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I do it myself. And, 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 you know, at some point, they do learn how to tie their shoes. If Parents, if you're still tying your 40-year-old shoes, there's a problem, and I'm just going to tell you that up front. But, but at the end of the day, I think we never lose that I do it myself mentality. I think it becomes something that guides us. It's something that, 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 that directs us in our life. And it's something that we are constantly fighting Because oftentimes what we do when we say, I do it myself, we're allowing our flesh to lead rather than the Spirit of God to lead. And so when I let my flesh lead, rather than leaning into the one who leads us and guides us, it's amazing how much trouble we get into. How many of you have ever said, I do it myself, and and you created a mess? You created this trouble that, that seemed to be insurmountable. And I think to myself, how many times if I were to go through the Bible and I look at if the decision had been, I do it myself, what would have happened with Abraham and Isaac? Imagine the the promise was given, the, the prophecy was said that Abraham would be the father of many nations, but but I do it myself when God said, Take your son, your only son, the son that you love. And and he goes, Uh uh-uh, uh, I ain't doing it that way. Because I'm going, to have a, I'm going to have the stars that you promised me. I'm going to have the numbers that you promised me. And he says, I do it myself. But he didn't do it that way. He did it the way God wanted him to do it. How, how, how many times did Samson get in trouble because he said, I do it myself? We look at how many times he, he, he got himself in trouble with the Philistines to the point that he lost his strength and lost his eyesight. And at the end of his life, he made this statement. He said, God, I'm not going to do it myself. I'm going to let you do it through me. How about, how about David and Goliath? Remember, what if, what, if, what if he listened? What if he listened to Saul when Saul was saying, put on this armor? He, and and, and what, if, what if he had done it that way rather than say, God, what, what, what would you lead me to do? What would you long for me to do? And because of that, we see the defeat of a giant. What about Elijah and the widow? She said, no, I do it myself. I'm going to make this last meal and it's going to be done. But, but he says, no, do me a favor. Do, do it this way. Listen to the voice of God. Listen to the, listen to the voice of the prophet. L- do it this way, and, and, and there will be blessing in your home. The problem is, church, is there are so many examples after examples. What about Daniel in the lion's den? If he said, I do it myself. What about the three Hebrew children? If they said, I do it myself. Would those stories have ever been written about in the Word? Because they didn't do it themselves. They did it the way God wanted it to be done, and the miracle happened. Because when we're led by God, he's not, he might lead us through a fire, but we come out on the other side not even smelling like we've been touched by singes. See, when we, when we, we, we might be led through the den, but, but you know what? The, the, the lions don't bite. We, we come to this place where we look at even Mary and Joseph. If you look at Joseph, when, when he was looking in his life and he was, he was saying, I'm, I'm going to marry my betrothed, finds out she's pregnant, what, did, what was his, his mindset was, I do it myself. I'll take her away and we'll get rid of her quietly. But God said, no, that's not the plan that I have. And when he said, okay, I submit myself to you, the miracle of, the miracle of Jesus 
is manifested. Did you know that even Jesus needed help? Most of the time we don't think about things like that. But when he, was in the, when, when he was in the wilderness, before his ministry ever got started, the Bible tells us that after he got through the 40 days, the Bible says in the book of Matthew, and it, it's recorded also in the book of Luke, it says that when they came to the end of the 40 days and weakness was in his body, we know he was filled of the Holy Spirit, but the Bible says that the angel came and ministered to him to help him. I do it myself. But you know what? We need help. We need help. We look at his ministry. And in John chapter 5, we find that he said these words. He said to his disciples, by myself, I can do nothing. If Jesus said that, can't we say that as well? But what we do is, guys, hear my heart. I'm not telling you that you shouldn't at least put an effort. I'm not saying that you shouldn't move forward. But what happens is, is that we don't allow the Spirit of God to lead us. We don't let the Word of God lead us. And as a result, we get into a mindset of, I do it myself. Jesus in the garden, the last time we see it. As he's getting ready to go to the cross in Matthew 26, he says, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. And he says to his disciples, Stay here and watch with me. Would you just stay here? I need your help. I need your help. And we all need help. If if Jesus couldn't do it himself, what makes you think you can do it yourself? If Jesus himself said, I can't do it myself, what makes you think you can do it yourself? You don't have the strength. You don't have the capacity. When people accept Jesus, they think that's it, but there's so much more. Jesus shared that there would be help coming. We're going to talk over the next five weeks about the helper called the Holy Spirit, and we are a Pentecostal, charismatic church that believes in the fullness of the gospel, that it's present and available for us today. But I want to just, I want to set the tone for us for just a minute. See, Jesus, in his words, he prophesied, he promised, and he purposed that the Holy Spirit was going to come. And as we talk about being led, it's important for us to know that if our Christian walk didn't need assistance, there wouldn't have been the need for divine help. If our Christian walk did not need help, If your Christian walk didn't need help, there wouldn't have been need for divine help. And Jesus said, no, this is, I know this even going into this thing, that there's going to be a help that's needed. He prophesied in John chapter 7 and verse 37, he said, on that day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty, come unto me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink, for the scriptures declare rivers of living water shall flow from his heart. Verse 39 is the key. When he said living water... He was speaking of the Spirit who would be given to everyone believing in Him. But the Spirit had not been yet given because Jesus had not yet entered into His glory. He was prophesying of the Spirit of God. He was prophesying that there would be something given to you and given to me to give us help and walk in assistance. It was promised to us in John chapter 14. He said, I will ask the Father to send you the Holy Spirit who will help you. Say, help me. He's going to help you because I need help. How many of you know we need help? Say, I need help. Some of you might be saying, help me, Jesus. But then there was a purpose. In John chapter 16 and verse 7, we see, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It, it, it is to your advantage that I go away. He said, for if I do not go away, the helper, that's the purpose, will not come. The helper, the one who's going to come alongside you, the one that's going to assist you, the one that's going to lead you and guide you into all truth, the helper will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you. There's a purpose. Say, I need help. See, if I know that I need help, whether you're a new believer Maybe you have just found the walk with God over the last matter of weeks or months. Or, or, or maybe, maybe you're still navigating whether or not God is even real. 
And, and how many of you know, I want a church that I got people in the room that are trying to figure out if Jesus is real. I want that in the church because I know that if we're doing that, we're reaching people with a place and giving them an opportunity for hope. So you might be a believer that's new. You might be somebody that's still trying to navigate this. You might be a 50-year saint. You grew up in church. You've never sinned in your life, and you are here. Praise the Lord. I would love to meet you. But the reality is, is this. We never get to a place where we don't need help. We never get to a place. I've never arrived at a place. I talked to a sweet lady yesterday. She's 91 years old. How many of you know Miss Mary Belcher? Anybody know Miss Mary? She said, I'm, I'm visiting with family. I'm up on the mountain right now. I can't come down. And I, she said, but she said this. She said, oh, God has been so good to me. He's helping me with my physical life. He's helping me with my physical body. And she said, but, but you know what? I understand that there's never a moment in life that I don't need any help. I need help. Say, I need help. See, allowing God to lead ought to be the lifestyle, not the option. See, I've got to get to a place where God becomes the leader of my life. I've got to come to a place where he leads me and guides me. The, 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 the uniqueness of who God is, though, is that he gives you the choice to follow or not follow. He gives me the choice as a pastor to either follow or not follow. Galatians 5.17, and herein lies the desires. The Bible tells us, and it says, the sinful nature wants to do evil which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants, and the Spirit gives us desires, say desires, that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. So there's two desires that are constantly at battle in all of us, and those desires often are what lead us in our life. We, when, we, when we get led by those desires, it says those two forces are constantly fighting each other. You want what you want, I do it myself, versus I do it what he wants. See, the, 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 the problem with that is that so oftentimes the evil desires win when the, flesh, when the flesh is weak. I'm not forgiving him. I'm not loving him. Did you know what they did to me? Those are, those are flesh desires, but when I open my Bible and I begin to see things that it says that there are these opposing desires, here's the conflict. So many people are still trying to hold on to both desires. See, when we desire one thing, but then we also desire another thing, there's a duplicity in us. We follow the desires of our flesh and what our flesh wants and likes. We always want one step in the world and one step in the things of God. Because we're afraid that if I, you know, I, I'm not saying that my kids are fleshly, but, but it's funny, you know, you can, how many of you have ever tried to organize a party with everybody and, and nobody gets back with you until the last minute because of this? They're trying to find out if something better is coming along. Isn't that the truth? Seems like it seems so difficult. But, but when we have one foot in the world and one foot in, lo, in faith, we wonder why the church is impotent. We wonder why the church doesn't see miracle signs and wonders. We wonder why our own lives are constantly frustrated. It's because I've got one, one foot in and one foot out. I'm being led this way and led that way. You know what? The Bible says in the book of James that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. I was reading a passage that, uh, from a, uh, out, out of A.W. Tozer's book, the great prophetic writer from, from, uh, from Chicago. He said this. He said, God is looking for people through whom he can do the impossible. What a pity we only attempt things we can do by ourselves. What a pity. We only do what we can do ourselves. Where's the, where's the walking on the water mindset? Where's the greater things mindset? Where is the accomplish? The problem is, is that we're not willing to be led into those places that are uncomfortable and uncommon. I want to challenge you this morning as we talk about these things. We cannot serve two masters. We tend to allow God to lead us only when we believe that it benefits us. I can leave that right there and call it an altar call right now. But the truth of the matter is, is this. When we only allow God to lead us, when we believe it benefits us, 
who are we following? Who are we following? I want you to do me a favor and turn with me to uh, Psalms chapter 23. Psalms chapter 23, it was so sweet before Arvind and I talked even this week. Uh, you know, we don't usually plan songs or anything like that. And that last song we sang was Psalms 23, and it was so cool. He had already had it all planned. But you know what? We tend, because we tend to allow God to lead us only when we believe it benefits us, what happens is, is we, re -quick, we quickly regain the reins when we see our desires slipping away. We take back. And as we step into Psalms 23, it's known as a messianic psalm. It speaks prophetically of Christ. But as I was reading this psalm, and we're only going to take a few moments to go through it because I want to get to Galatians in just a second. But it says in Psalms 23, are you there? We're going to read. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We just sang about it this morning. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup up runneth over, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Herein lies the challenge. If I'm truly allowing the Spirit of God to lead my life, I have to ask myself some questions. Question number one, do I allow him to lead me as my shepherd? Always. Do we allow him to be our shepherd always? Do you realize that when we talk about a messianic psalm, we're talking about Christ? Did you know that the Bible tells us that he is the good shepherd? And a good shepherd is only going to take you places that you ought to go and do things that he ought to do. Do I always allow him to be? Do I always allow him to lead as my shepherd? Have I allowed his wants to become my wants? Or do you have your wants that are taking precedent over his wants? See, that's really hard if we'll get honest with ourselves. Well, God, I want that new car. I want those new tennis shoes. I want that new bike. I want, I want that new house. I want that new job. I want that, I want that money in the bank account. And there become wants that supersede his wants. Now, does God want to bless you? Yes, because this passage says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That means that you come to a place in your life that you're not having need of anything because he is all you need. But are you allowing him to lead? See, the Bible tells us that I have allowed, have I allowed his wants to become my wants? He gives us the desires of our heart. But when my desires yield to his desires, when I allow his desires to lead me, I'm going to be led into these places. It says here, it says, do I, do I lie down when, when, when and where he makes me? You know what? That's a tough one. I was, I, was, I was thinking about this. The Bible says, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. Did you know that sometimes God will be walking with you and all of a sudden you'll say, okay, chill out right now. Let's rest. And we're like, no, no, no. I got to get it done. I got to, I got to accomplish this. I got to get that finished. I got to, I got to do this. But, but, but God, I, I, I got to clean the garage. But God, I got to do the laundry. I got to. How many of you have stopped when God says, okay, now's the time. I want to make you lay down. And how many of you have ever been made to lay down? Anybody ever been in that moment where you've been made to lay down and all of a sudden everything is crushed around you and you are weak and you are broken and you are crying out to God and you're saying, God, I'm sorry that I was doing it my way, but God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow you to make me lay down. Say, make me lay down, God. See, it, come unto me. Am I allowing him to lead me into the still places? The Bible says in the book of John, he says, my peace I leave with you. My peace I leave with you. Have I allowed his path to become my path? Or do we step onto his path for a season? It's kind of like the railroad tracks on this design that Emma and I created. I want you to see there, there's a choice right there. There's a choice to go to the left or there's a choice to go to the right. You have to determine and allow the Spirit of God to lead you on the right track. Because often when we go by the track we want to go on, it leads to destruction. The Bible says the path, that path leads to destruction. But his path 
leads to blessing. See, the problem is, is we get to this choice in the road and we say, no, I do it myself. I do it myself. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You are not. Can I, can I, can I, can I say that? You are not the way. You are not. You are not. Just say, I'm not the way. Say, say this with me. I, I am not the truth. And I am not the way. I, I am not the life. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. Now, let me ask you another question as we finish this up. Do I dine where he dines? Do I dine where he dines? And what am I saying? The Bible talks about communion in the New Testament. We can find about it, or Jesus talks about it in the book of Matthew. He talks about it in the book of Luke. We talk about it in the book of 1 Corinthians. But what do we, when we have this dining, he says, I prepare a table for you. But you know what? You go by the table often, and this is what we do. Mm, I don't want that. I'd rather have McDonald's. And he's offering you filet mignon. You say, I want, a, I want a burger. But God's saying, you know what, I got something better for you. The problem is, is that you're wanting to lead rather than be led. And see, when I, desire to, when I desire to lead and not be led, I will pass a table that has been prepared for me, even in the presence of all the horror and the terrible things that are going on in life, and I can see that that table has been made. And you know what? There's something about sitting at the table of God. When I sit at the table of God and the, the enemies are all around me, there is a peace at that table. There is a filling at that table. There is a joy at that table. There is a fulfillment at that table. But the problem is, is most of the time we want to be led, we want to lead rather than be led. Because we say, I do it myself. I do it myself. I have allowed the house, have I allowed the house of the Lord to become my dwelling place? Have I allowed, have, have I allowed this place of God? The Bible says, in him you also were being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The challenge is, is this. Oftentimes the house of the Lord becomes the secondary thought to what we want to do. And so I challenge you this morning, if we've been in church for any length of time, we've heard the reply often when we don't know what to do, we'll be led. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to be led? When we look at that word led, it's the willingness to be guided and directed by another. So as I have a thought, I, what and who I allow to guide and direct my decisions will identify the quality of my followership. Am I, am I willing to be led and guided? Tony, would you come? Am I willing? What am I, what and who I allow to guide and direct my decisions will identify the quality of my followership. You know, it's really not a problem that God's not speaking. The problem therein lies is the quality of the follower. Because sometimes we want to follow and sometimes we want to lead. And God often says, if you want to lead, you can have the leadership anytime you want it. Take it. But you know, the truth of the matter is, is that will be that pathway that leads to destruction. God has always led his people. And I was thinking about this as I was getting ready to close our sermon this morning. You know, if I really allow the Spirit of God to lead, if I allow the Word of God to lead, if, if I am allowed to be led, I don't need to make my own decisions when I can be led by the one who pre-plans my future. You know, the Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. You know what? I don't, I don't need to struggle with questions when I'm led by the one with all the answers. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 14, it says this is the confidence that we have that if we ask anything according to his word and will, we can have those things. Matthew 7, 7 says, ask. It says, knock. It, 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 it says, seek. We don't have to struggle with questions when I'm led by the one who never struggles. And, and you know what? I, I don't need to worry over the issues I'm facing 
when I can be led by the one who has never been stunned, stumped, surprised. He's never been fearful, flabbergasted, or fretful. There's never thing, anything that God has ever done. There's, the Bible says in Revelations, I am the Alpha and the Omega. You know, he's the beginning and the end. There's never been a moment that God has tried, been stumped by a mystery. Wow, I wonder what I'm going to do. There's never been a riddle given to him that he didn't know the answer. And the problem is, is that what we try to do is we try to live our lives by, 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 by I do it myself rather than be led by him. If you'll turn it with me to Galatians chapter 5, we're just about done. Galatians chapter 5. As I set the tone for Galatians chapter 5, I, I just... I was thinking as we talk about this series called Being Led, I, I was thinking about the next several weeks, we're going to investigate, you know, various aspects of being led. We're going to, a lot of our discussion will have to do with the Holy Spirit. But, but I want you to think about this for just a moment. In chapter 5, as I get to chapter, chapter 5, verse 16, but I want to just kind of give you a tone. It says, Paul has just been teaching the church about what it means to be free in Christ. We have a liberty. He taught those who live by the Spirit, this helper who eagerly we, who we eagerly wait for. We also find that in the middle of this newfound freedom, there was a conflict about sin and legalism. But here is the verse that I shared with you as we kicked off the service. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 16 says, I advise you, to live according to your new life in the Holy Spirit. That word advise indicates a choice is available. We can choose to live according to this new life or we can choose to live any way we want to. God is a gentleman and he will freely allow you to do what you want to do. So herein lies the next challenge. The identification of an individual who's taken the advice of Paul to live by this, thing, this, this spirit that God says, this new life in the spirit, is found in the verse number 22. It says here, it says, but when the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit controls our lives... There, that word is missing there, and I need to let you know. It says, when the, when the Holy Spirit controls our lives... He will produce this kind of fruit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no conflict with the law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. If we are living now by the Holy Spirit, let us follow the Holy Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. See, one of the things that I know is this, is I'm identified by who I am. I'm sorry, I am identified by who I am allowing, uh, what did I say there? I don't know if I've got that right. I am identified by who I am allowing to lead. That makes no sense. I am identified by who I am allowing to lead. Get rid, get rid of that. Does that make sense or am I just reading it wrong? Am I just reading it wrong? Here I am. I'm going, I got this moment. Here it is. And I'm going, that doesn't make sense in my head. Go ahead. Put that back up there. Let me see it. Put it back up there if you don't mind. I'm identified by who I am allowing to lead. There you go. There you go. I should have put a comment in there for my benefit. Yeah. When it's hard to maintain fruit, I need to check who's in control. You know, as we get ready to close, I, I created a little acronym as we get to go home. There's so many more things I want to share with you, and we're going to talk about it over the next several weeks. But before the Apostle Paul wrote these verses to the church at Galatia, he had to come to a reality in his own life of how to be led. And so let me share just a simple acronym from the word L-E-D, led. The first thing I want you to know is this, this simple acrostic is this. In order to be led, you have to leave something. You have to leave something. What am I talking about? 
you have to lead, you, you, have to, you have to be willing. Before I can be led to something, I have to be willing to let go of where I am. See, if I'm trying so hard to hold on, I can't be led to something that's better. Because what I'm doing is I'm looking back, and, and sometimes we think it's a good thing. But can I be honest with you? Sometimes it's not a good thing. Sometimes it might be a hurt, a pain a discomfort, maybe it's a sin. And you know what? Repentance is necessary. Guys, I, I can't be led to something better if I'm not willing to leave something behind. Paul made this statement, forgetting those things that are behind, I press toward the mark. You know what? He, his spirit said, you know what? I recognize that there are things that are behind me, but I also recognize there's better things in front of me. So in order to be led, I've got to leave something. The second thing I want to share with you is this, is you have to engage the Spirit, E. You have to engage Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is maybe something new for you. Maybe you have prayed for as a youth and maybe you were at camp and something happened and maybe a tongue trickled through your lips for a moment, but you never truly engaged the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit, if, I, if I, I have to leave my old thoughts, my old habits, my old, my old actions, my old attitudes, my old beliefs, my old hurts, I have to leave those things because I have to believe something is better. So when I engage the Holy Spirit, what am I doing? I'm, I'm engaging this relationship through prayer, living and receiving empowerment and being filled. And the last thing is this is, I've got to leave something, but I've got to engage, but then I have to be determined. See, what happens, though, is, is that I make a decision to leave, and I choose to engage, but you know what? There's this thing called the enemy who's always there trying to trip you up along the way. There's always something that says, you know what? It's not all it's cracked up to be. Your walk with the Holy Spirit, He's really not your helper. He's not really your, 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 your the, the, He's not really your comforter. He, he's not really your guide. And, and so what we begin to do is we begin to drift back rather than stay determined. How many of you have ever started a walk with God and then all of a sudden it seems like all hell broke loose in your life? It seems as if everything came unpacked, everything came unglued, everything came di became difficult. You stepped out in faith, you made an engagement in the things of God, you left what was behind you, and then all of a sudden the car broke down, the dog bit the kid. You know, I mean, I don't know what it is. Roof needed to be replaced, the gutters fell off, you know, you know the tires needed to be, you know, I don't know what it is. But I've got to be determined to be led. See, we need to become more determined than we are distracted. Removing the obstacles and preserving, persevering and preserving with endurance. I've got two passages of Scripture I want to share with you. Would you stand to your feet? I want you to just stand to your feet right now. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1, it says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. See, I make a decision. You ever watch an athlete? You watch an athlete when it comes to cycling or running. They're wearing these things called singlets or, or the, the, the microfiber type clothes that are so light. They take off everything. They, nobody runs a marathon in a suit and dress shoes. What are they doing? They're, they're putting on something that's light and easy. So what he's saying is, the, the author of Hebrews is saying, what do you got to let go of so that you can remain determined and fighting for something? Let us, let us strip off every weight. And all get, all, Acts tells us this. Acts tells us this. It says, my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for the finishing, for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord. I've got to be determined that my life matters. My life counts. There's something that God wants me to do. With every head, out, every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking forward. This is that moment of the service where I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not asking. I just know that there's probably folks in the room that in order to be led, the first thing they need to do is let go of something. And, and I'm going to ask a question. 
you might say to me, Pastor Bob, there's a sin in my life, and I need to let go of that sin. You, def- you identify the sin. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's smoking. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's anger. Maybe there's something in your life. Those are, those are catastrophic, but maybe it's something small, or maybe it's a gossip. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a, just a lack of belief. There's something in you right now that you would say, Pastor, I need to repent right now. Would you raise your hand real quick? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You, you just know that you got to let something go. You, got, you can't step in and be led until, until you leave something behind. You got to be willing to, to leave it behind. You got to be willing to leave it behind, church, so that you can have the next thing. You might be here. You might say to me, Pastor Bob, I- I'm struggling with the Holy Spirit. I'm having a difficulty in that walk. And, and, and God, would you, just, would you just say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I- I'm struggling engaging the Holy Spirit on a regular basis. Just raise your hand real quickly. Or maybe, maybe there's been something in your life that you've noticed that you're not as determined as you once were. Maybe you've walked with God for a while and you're not as diligent in your faithful studies. You're not as determined to not get distracted. And, and you're just saying, Pastor, I just need some help in, in, my, in being further determined. Raise your hand. Is there anybody in the room? Hallelujah. Would you all say this with me? Just pray this prayer with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. And I ask for forgiveness for those things that I have allowed to hold me back from being led by you. Father, whether it's a sin, whether it's a weight, whether it's a hindrance, whether it's a past pain, whether it's a belief, whether it's family, whether it's a spousal hurt, whether it's depression, whether it's anxiety, God, I leave it now and I step forward and engage the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, help me. Walk with me. Teach me. Show me. Lead me into the paths that you have for my life. And God, help me to not be distracted. Father, I just pray right now for this congregation. And and I ask, Heavenly Father, that what you're doing in their lives. Father, the, the difference isn't made in this room. The difference is when we walk out of this place. Father, I pray right now for every person in this room that they would truly be led by you in every arena of their life. The the leading of your word, the leading of your spirit, the yielding of themselves to your plan and not their own. God, help us to stop declaring, I do it myself. Because God, if we need help, you are the helper and sent it already. Father, I pray for every person in you. That, God, we would live a life that is so led by God in every aspect of who we are, Lord, that we would never be the same in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you might be here in this place and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. I am going to ask the question. You'd say to me, Pastor Bob, I I maybe once was saved, but I I don't know right now. If, If something happened in my life today... I am not confident I'd go to heaven. If that's you in this room and you just want prayer, raise your hand real quickly. Is there anybody? There's a hand right there. There's a hand right there. Is there anybody else? You want to just be confident. You just want to be confident. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you just pray this prayer with me? Say, dear Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sin. I want to be right with you. I want to thank you, God, for loving me, for saving me, and making me a new creature. Father, forgive me of that sin that has held me back and give me a new life that only comes through Jesus. Father, I embrace Jesus as Lord of my life. Thank you for eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you raised your hand, I just want to give you a hug after service. I'm going to go ahead and dismiss church. I know that there's going to be a meeting immediately following service, but I'm not sure where Melody is. Melody, are we doing it in here? I got a yes in here. 
Okay. Immediately following service, we're going to be in here. If you're part of Vacation Bible School at any level, I need you in this room just to stay put for just a few minutes. I want to go ahead and release the rest of you, but I want you to make sure that you hug a neck. Find somebody that you might not know and introduce yourself. Like Pastor Candy said, the room is full. I promise you there's people here you don't know. Make sure that you introduce yourself to somebody right now. Let's leave with a shout of hallelujah on the count of three. Are you ready? No, wait a minute. I only had four of you say yes. Are you ready to leave with a count of, on a count of three of hallelujah? You ready? Two, three. Hallelujah. God bless you. Have a great day.